Welcome to the Relationship Recovery Podcast, hosted by Jessica Knight, a certified life coach who specializes in narcissistic and emotional abuse. This podcast is intended to help you identify manipulative and abusive behavior, set boundaries with yourself and others, and heal the relationship with yourself so you can learn to love in a healthy way. Hello, and thank you so much for being here. Today's guest is Victoria. Victoria helps women going through divorce and men with the financial aspect of a high conflict divorce. And now when I was preparing for this episode, and even before the episode started, I said to Victoria, I feel like this is going to be a non-emotional episode. I've had 125 episodes on here, and I have not really talked about financial abuse. I haven't talked about that side of the coin that much, but it ended up being quite emotional and talking about emotions and emotions that do go into divorce but also why it's important to try and separate that sometimes, because especially if you're going to be headed to a high conflict divorce, it can be helpful to separate out some of the finances. And if there are not kids involved, using some of Victoria's tools and resources and ideas and mindsets will be really helpful in streamlining that for you and helping you feel confident and secure moving forward. I really think that you will get a lot out of this episode. I know Victoria will be back. And we'll dive deeper into some of these topics. So as always, if you need support with your divorce, your high conflict divorce, you can always reach out to me at jessica at jessicanightcoaching.com. And as you know, you can follow me at Emotional Abuse Coach and at emotionalabusecoach.com. Hi, Victoria. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me, Jessica. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you tell us who you are and what you do? Well, my name is Victoria Kurloff. I am a CDFA, a certified divorce financial analyst, a family financial Mm -hmm. mediator, and a certified divorce specialist. And that's really just a bunch of designations put on my personal experience uh, Mm -hmm. of being a man. I was in a 10-year relationship with a narcissist, and I created essentially a financial report to leave him. And that was the basis of my business divorce analytics. So when you say that you created a report, like a financial report to leave him, can you share a little bit about what that means? Like what it's because I know from talking to you separately that you realize in order to leave and to leave safely and with money that you were going to have to leave in a really smart way. You're going to have to outsmart him and be ahead of the game here. Absolutely. Well, okay. I think we have to first begin by breaking down divorce into the four different phases. So Mm -hmm. I subscribed to the belief that divorce has an emotional, social, financial, and legal component. The emotional phase begins when you decide you want a divorce and it concludes when the other person is told and they finally accept that the divorce is going to happen. The social side is when you start telling your family and friends, especially if you have kids, you need to come up with a good divorce story um, and really explain to them what this transition is going to be so they don't listen to their friends. And that's where a divorce coach (laughs) is really ideal to handle the emotional and social side because it's when the emotions are unmanaged that it blows up the third and fourth phase, which is the financial and legal. So the financial phase is really where rubber hits the road and it's where divorce stops being an emotional event and it turns into a business deal. This is the biggest financial transition of your life, and you absolutely need to approach divorce as if it is a business, because you are literally negotiating a contract. When you get married, there's something called the marital estate that is formed when you submit your um, certificate of marriage. So essentially, you have three entities in the relationship, you, your partner, and the state. Mm -hmm. The state is form of this corporation called a marriage that you now have to essentially 
un do an unmerger and mm -hmm. break apart which department goes with what person and so forth. So the best way really to navigate that is through a financial report. Um, most divorces, you're going to have a change of cash flow. And this is what, when I was facing my separation, I was terrified because I had started my financial advising business. I was new. I did not have consistent income. And now I had to figure out where I was going to live. Was it going to be in the marital estate or in the home that had like way too much property and a mm. high mortgage? Or was I going to have to downsize? So I took a step back and I simply, I was so emotionally invested in that home. To this day, I really have, I still have problems when I drive by. I can't actually, I, I avoid it actively because mm -hmm. it's just so traumatizing. And I had fallen out of love. I call him Voldemort. Uh, <laughs> he must not be named. <laughs> um, I had fallen out of love with him and I put all of my heart into that house. And when I looked at it on paper, that house was really expensive, especially without his income. So making this completely analytically based helped me make really good choices. And also when I was going through our bank statements, because to, in order to figure out if I could afford the house, I had to figure out just what my life was costing. And yeah. I mean, that's the hardest part about being an American is we are taught to be consumers. If you feel bad, go buy something. If you have a celebration, go out to dinner. There's not a lot of emotional regulation techniques that are developed into our capitalistic system, which in some ways is really detrimental as you are now facing a divorce because you not only have the divorce to navigate, but you have unresolved financial feelings that come up when you start digging into the numbers and the budget. So it was through the budget that I realized I uh, that keeping the house was just not going to be good for me. Yeah. And I think that way actually helped me start planning ahead to figure out what I wanted my post-divorce life to look like, because I was living in this wonderful house and I could not imagine giving it up. But finally, once I made that choice, and really it was the numbers making the choice for me, it became so much easier to lean into this new lifestyle I was going to lead. It also but, sounds like you had to face that reality, like really like strongly of, you know, if I want out of this marriage and if I want out, like without spending more money on legal fees, fighting oh, for gosh. something that I don't think I can even afford, I think it helps mm -hmm. like that, you know, there's still grief involved. Like the emotions are there around like leaving this home that you love, like, but also it was like, well, what do I want more? I want to be out of this marriage and I want to be able to have a new mm -hmm. life and then maybe have a house one day that I love even more. But right now I want, I need Freedom. to separate that. Like I need to see the numbers, which I think is something that a lot of people, especially at the beginning, when we're thinking about, am I going to get divorced? It's like the last thing we think about is oh, yeah. the numbers. But I probably have because it's overwhelming. And half because it's the emotions of leaving. How do I leave? And then if there's kids, there's all these other emotions. And mm -hmm. which that's primarily where my work is based and all of that kind of stuff. But I think the practical end of this is a transaction. And the way that you phrased it of like the corporation is the marriage. And this is has to be a transactional thing. I actually have one client who thinks about it just like that. And I think it has been so useful because every yeah. time we talk through the emotional side, we then get that like every session, it's like, okay, we call it like the business section of our, of our work sometimes of let's, okay, that's here. Now, what do we do with it? You know? And part of that business arrangement is like working with me and there's someone else he works with on the business side of it. Like somebody who does like more corporate law because he is an entrepreneur and then the divorce yeah. side, but he spends less money because it's not all going to the lawyer to figure out and do things. It's like more, it's more like, let me have a team where I can think about these things and get clear. And I imagine you have a lot of people that come to you that are like, I don't even know where to start. Most people have no idea where to start yeah. because where you feel it first is with your emotions and with your kids and your family. Yeah. And that's where your work as a divorce coach is so meaningful because you're able to prepare that person to go into the next two phases. 
with their best self. Because it, as you said, we don't know how much our life costs. And now you're being faced with the finances and really finances get put off to the end. And it is the first thing you guys need to be doing. Because if you do not understand how the divorce is going to impact your cash flow and your property, you can't make good decisions. Mm -hmm. You don't have the facts. And so when I was building the rest of my report out, the cash flow is the beginning part. But then you look at the rest of the divorce settlement, which is really the asset and debt division. So not only do you have to understand the cost of your life and your post-divorce life, you now have to make a list of everything of, of value that you guys have acquired. And that could be pretty darn overwhelming. And when you break it down into the, you know, the different phases where the financial phase is where you get all of your financial facts laid out. And if you are working with your partner, you have a lot better opportunity to keep things transparent. Mm -hmm. And there's generally going to be some level of financial disparity or education disparity rather within the marriage where one person takes care of the grocery shopping and the other person opens the mail and pays the bills. And that's normal. But now when you're facing a divorce, you might not actually have the access to know how much your life is costing. And so there's a lot of awareness that has to go on. And you also have to be nice to yourself. There is so much shame that is wrapped up in money. And especially if you make a lot of it, people think you're good at managing it. And in, in my case, I've seen a lot of clients and it tends to be the clients that are more well off that have the opportunity to make a lot of money that don't value it as greatly mm -hmm. and get them into trouble. And so you have to begin by really understanding the cash flow and the property division phase. And so for every divorce in America, it doesn't matter what state you live in, there is the financial disclosure process. And so not only do you have to fill out your assets and debt worksheet, but you also have to do your cash flow, which is your budget. I keep talking about it because it's really important. Um, but generally, it is from your income and expense declaration that your child support calculation is derived from. And it varies based off of what state you're in. But most of the time, the most important factor is your total income. And mm -hmm. if you have a W-2, that can be pretty easy to calculate. But if your husband or wife is a business owner or an entrepreneur, there's a little bit more analysis that goes into that. So you absolutely need to have a financial expert on your team. So you have really good base data to then either build a divorce report on or to negotiate with. It's yeah. then it's normally when you don't have that transparency and clear data that the fourth phase, the legal phase takes over everything and you wind up in litigation as opposed to mediation. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of cases, a lot of high conflict cases will end up in litigation, um, mostly because of the high conflict individual. Um, but I think that mm -hmm. I think that what is so helpful about what you do and also the way that you describe it is that if you're going in at the beginning with here are the facts that I have, these are like, these are numbers, the like, this is a math equation, you know, at the end of the day, I am clear on it. And this is where we are. It really takes out a lot of room for argument when it comes to that. It takes oh, yeah. out, it just almost like in a way it like takes off, takes away that sword from that high conflict individual. Of course, there's going to be other ways they go about it, but it's more like, no, but this is it. Mm -hmm. Right. And the, like, it's not really Absolutely. changeable. I have a question that I know like, I know that people would be listening to this if I don't ask it and they're going to be like, how, you know, <laughs> like, what about this? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people that have no idea what the finances are because of financial abuse. They have no idea. They're like, it's kept on the side. It's kept away or they've been coerced into not working or they have chosen not to work, whatever it might be. Either they have, don't have access to it. If they have access to it, they would have to kind of like get into that other person's computer. They may just not know. They may feel like this person is hiding money and like may have an idea as to where it is, but may also not. So though I know those are a lot of variables, but like, what would you suggest to somebody who literally is listening to this and they're like, well, I have no idea how much money we have. What do I do? Where would they even start? Well, you got to begin somewhere. And so 
when you are looking to get out and you are dealing with a highly abusive individual, you need to be thinking about your day-to-day operations first. Where are you going to live? How much is it going to cost? And if you have kids, what is that cost going to look like? Because they're pretty expensive. And so you have to just start, it's going to take some time, but you just start building out um, your your costs. And I have a, um, a budget blueprint on my website that you can got, uh, buy mm-hmm. that will actually walk you through building out your current cost of living. So then you could project forward what your post-divorce cost is going to be. So you could start figuring out how much money do I need? And you have to save yourself Mm -hmm. and you have to show up for your future self. And I know from experience, I was abused for 10 years and grew up in an abusive household before that. So I still have to work on it, but I am worthy of using my own money for me instead of giving it to someone else. And You know, you have to kind of work through and develop a more positive money mindset. So you have to start squirreling money away if you have absolutely no funds and you can get creative with it where maybe you have access to the credit cards um, Mm -hmm. and buy something really expensive and return it, right? Uh, See if you can get it for cash and you just start saving money that way. Maybe you can add a couple bucks on to the grocery bill and take it in cash and start an emergency fund that way. If you have a 401k, you can take a loan out. But at the end of the day, this is going to cost you some money to get rid of this relationship. And you have to think about it. It is really your independence and freedom that you are fighting for. So you need to show up for yourself. And there's a lot of ways. Once you kind of admit to the universe that you need help, it has a funny way of conspiring to help you. Yeah. But verbalizing that help, uh, that request for help can be pretty challenging. Yeah. And um, I always tell people too, that if they are experiencing financial abuse, like your, your lawyer, I mean, one, you would want your lawyer to understand that, but two, yeah. there are, you know, there are lawyers, there are legal assistants at shelters. There are resources out there that if you're like, I don't know where to start, I would find the local resource because there's even and I'm in Massachusetts there and I'm on this email list where women that need actually I'm sure it's for men too to be honest but people who need um assistance getting out um and like don't have the money for even an attorney they will connect you with to somebody who is either willing to do the work pro bono which you might have to wait a while but you'll get it eventually or I think they have people that are like they work on a Fee, but your lawyer would know how to begin to get that information. And sometimes it's through like the big scary word of a subpoena. But at the end of the day, yeah. it is a subpoena is not very scary. It's actually just a way to get evidence that you don't have. Um, and I think that like I like where you said start somewhere and change the mindset to like I deserve it. Because then when you go and ask for the help, I imagine that you'll also be able to download in your own mind, here are all the things I do know, right? Because a lot of times we tell Mm -hmm. ourselves like we know nothing, but it's like, okay, I actually know that like I put groceries on this credit card. I've seen him have that credit card. There seems to be a stack of credit cards over here. I've had people literally write down all the numbers of credit cards they can find and just save it because at least then you know where the accounts are and like how many there Mm -hmm. there are. You can go to the bank. If your name is on the bank account, you're entitled to go get those records. Even if someone tells you that you can't, like if your name's on the bank account, go to the bank, ask for it. You know, you can do some of these things. And like I said, your lawyer, other resources may have some ideas of how to begin to get it, but you'd want to be able to make sure you have someone that understands what you're going through so that it's not like I need to figure this all out on my own, but it's like, okay, there's probably different levels of capability here, at least at the very, very beginning. Some people may have no access to money. And I've definitely worked with people that have that. And honestly, what they do to work with me to get started is, and I think this is so creative, but I've seen maybe five people do it. They will get money sent from friends or family members to their Venmo account. And then they Venmo me, which I think is like so smart or like they'll, they, if they are creative at all, they'll start selling some things on Etsy or things like that. Like there's ways that we can get around it, right? Because what we want is that future life, you know, Mm -hmm. and not the one we're in now. You touched on this briefly about the 401k account. And I actually have a question about that because, and I think that what we're really talking about here is like 
probably the situation where both partners work in some way. Both partners have money in some way. You know, there's probably different mindsets and rules and things to think about for those that are in severe financial abuse situations. But for those that are like, say, I'm working, you're working, I want to leave because this is abusive and I have a job and I have a 401k, but all my money goes to the same joint account. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, well, I can't, like, what do I, I've had a lot of people ask, like, should I take money out of my 401k? Like if I just have money sitting in there, what should I do? Is that something that you recommend or that you talk to people about? I get that question a lot. Well, now keep in mind that this is not investment advice and anything on this podcast is for general education purposes. And you are going to have a very specific case that's going to require a certain type of consideration. So always seek uh, expert assistance. Um, But for the most part, if you are facing a situation where you have your current finances are being monitored, you need to find a way to essentially create an opportunity to either save the money um, or to withdraw it. And if your 401k is really the only place that you have to access it, you can take a loan. A loan you have to repay, or there might be different terms based off of how your plan is set up. If you take a loan, you can avoid a 10% penalty fee that the IRS levies before 59 and a half. The money will be taxed as ordinary income if you do take a withdrawal as opposed to a loan. Um, it might be a little different. So mm-hmm. It sounds like it is a tool that somebody might look into, but there's a few various ways and individual circumstances. So do do your homework. But if, if the Definitely. money's there, it's a place to look at this point. And I think people, like what I see is people get really hung up on making any money decision because then it makes the divorce real. Yeah. And yeah. it is that big next step that kind of, unavoidable if you're actually going to file, but it really kind of opens up the dam and now you have everything else to do. So, you know, the 401k is one option, but if you have like family and friends, obviously you want to support yourself if uh, if you can find your resources, but don't be afraid to ask your parents. I have a lot of clients that (laughs) they're really afraid to ask their family members for help, but once they did the, you know, they kind of got all the support they needed. And it's just really important that you understand that this is going to be a a a financial transition and it is going to cost something. And there are ways by breaking the process down into those four phases and then partnering with the right professional to keep costs, I don't want to say low, but you can keep it effective. And if you, I do a lot of high conflict mediations. So I didn't really tell you the full story um, of leaving Voldemort, but Essentially, what I was able to do is I put everything, all of the financial implications um, I researched out. And because I'm a math nerd, mm-hmm. I put it into a report. And I backed it up with documentation and I sat at our kitchen table with him. I really didn't say a single word. The report laid everything out. And he was a highly psychologically, physically and emotionally abusive narcissist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I still have that man that I uh, have either like worked very hard to heal or or I'm still in the process of, but I realized that my best opportunity to get away from him was by working with him. And now I also have a different psychological uh, background because my dad was a CIA, um, like he worked in the CIA as a Russian nuclear engineer during the Cold War. So I was always being put into these opportunities to deal with high conflict people because my dad had a business And he was in between engineers, executives, and clients. And those are a whole lot of like disagreeable people. Mm -hmm. Um, But the way that he taught me how to communicate was numerically. And so he brought all of these high conflict, hard charging, good old boys to the table by focusing on the actual facts because they respected them. They might not respect each other, but at the end of the day, Facts are what dominates this process. Even if you are dealing with a narcissist, they are living in their magical reality, but the facts are indisputable. And that's what I did with Voldemort. He was an engineer. And so he went through everything and he confirmed through the documentation that I added to the report that my numbers were accurate. 
And because I had given us two options, option A is what we sold the house, option B, um, he bought me out and then we split the rest of the property. And when I laid out those two options, along with our cash flow analysis, heck, it was like 20 minutes, Jessica, and we were yeah. done. Yeah. We gone through everything. And it was because he knew he was going to be okay. He made far more money than me at that point. And he always was calling me his golden little goose. Though mm. I mean, I took care of everything and he got to use his money for fun. Yeah. And so when he was looking at our separation, we didn't have kids, but for him, it was a huge financial loss. He was going to have to cover his own bills. Poor kid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And by actually showing him that he could, um, and this is what his settlement would look like, he was able to like not get nasty with me. I mean, the night before, a few nights before, he like, you know, uh, beat me pretty good. And I was even more determined. And when I sat down with him, I'm like, I don't know how this is going to go. But gosh, everything went magically almost because the finance, we didn't focus on the night before, whatever it was, mm -hmm. we didn't focus on that made our relationship fail. Instead, I was so committed to my future self, my future Victoria. I wanted her to live. Yeah. I realized when I was with him, the last, he strangled me one night and I realized, oh, wow, this is serious crap. He's yeah. totally met range. And I needed to fight for myself. And it still took me like a year to get out for after that event. But I realized that in some ways, I had 10 years of being his emotional regulation system. And yeah. I was not about to give that up just because it had gotten pretty damn bad. I realized that if I was able to stay and tap dance to his tune, we could have a really peaceful uncoupling and we could not have to get attorneys involved. We could do all of this ourselves. We didn't have to argue about the house. And, you know, the universe was right there with me and we were able to come to consensus and it was only because we had that report. I did not really have to say a single word to him. I put my heart and soul into that report and it did the talking for me because it was fact-based. It wasn't, you know, you're a jerk and I want you to jump off a cliff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it no, was, it was here are the, yeah, here are the numbers. Like, like you took the emotion out and even the conversation out. Like, and it sounds like he went back to try and like fact check it. And then he did. And he was like, okay, I guess this is right at the end of yeah. it. And it's also like you got into you, instead of thinking emotionally of like, I mean, which, which would still be very valid of, I'm afraid of this person and this is how he's going to react. It sounds like what you were able to do is like, you're like, okay, I have those emotions. I'm going to put this over here, but I also know how mm -hmm. he thinks. And if I know how he thinks, then I can create this in a way, like you said, to show him he will be fine, but, and I'm going to give him options and I'm actually going to do the work to show him the options. Then yeah, I'm getting into his head and showing him how this is going to go essentially he can do whatever he wants to fact check it because you, like you said, your math is your thing. You fact checked it. And then he can like then decide, but it almost like takes out that it I'm like, I'm like stumbling on the words because I want to get it right. But it's like, you took out the argument really. Well, I took the yeah. fight out of the dog. Exactly. Right. By you just, you know, you met him in, in the way his mind works. So you probably didn't even notice that at the time. Oh, you just met him where his head was. Well, what I have experienced, because this has now led to me doing lots of other uh, yeah. like mediations, narcissists generally, they are great at business or at least at tracking their money. They, they might be so disagreeable, they don't ever really rise to the ranks of their employer, or they might be that charming narcissist business owner that, uh, you know, has a wonderful facade on the outside. But when you go home, you know, they're beating their wife and kids. <laughs> mm. Oh, gosh. Um, but regardless, if you are able to activate their brain in a way that helps them skip over all of those emotions that are associated with the uncoupling, you can actually circumvent the legal process where you could come to an agreement and as long and you can negotiate everything out and just have your attorney file the, the the settlement paperwork and you can be good to go it's really empowerful though because you're able to 
use all of the abuse and your kind of messed up education and their emotional regulation to your benefit. And this is where you could kind of be your own little CIA spy. You know, you know what sets them off and you know how to keep them, their emotions under control. So you figure out just how to to orchestrate everything. And that's where having a, a divorce coach and a financial analyst, and it's really important, you work with professionals that are skilled with narcissism. Mm-hmm. This is the deep end of the divorce pool. And amicable divorces, and I have a lot of clients that get along that don't have personality issues. Those are a different ball of wax than when you're dealing with somebody that has the propensity to change their face and their mask slips at the drop of the hat. Um, It's very easy when you're not skilled and you're trying to negotiate with a narcissist. Um, If the mediator is not skilled, they can be triangulated. So you need to really be building a team that understands how to give the, the narcissist two options that you can live with, right? The two options I presented, Voldemort, those are both options I was in agreement with. And I gave him the false illusion of choice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, right, right. Because you, you already knew. You already knew what the, like, you're like, no, I, because you got yourself there emotionally before mm-hmm. you even presented it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's really important for everybody to remember that this is the biggest business deal of your life. And if you are not showing up and if you do not know your numbers, it's almost impossible to make decisions that are in agreement with your post-divorce self and your greater life. There's so much that you can get bogged down with, especially if you have kids in the picture and they're being used as, you know, pawns and it's just a, a horrible thing. Um, But in my experience, when you actually take the time to make a divorce financial report, you are able to actually avoid a lot of the custody issues with the co-parent because a lot of the times, and I know there's other situations, right? Not everything always works out this way, but a lot of the times the kids become financial tools that they, you know, they don't want to have child support. So they're not going to, they want full custody or half custody, whatever it is. And when you actually are able to take a step back, show them what the financial transition is going to be, you're able to kind of recalibrate things and help them focus on how good their post-divorce life is going to be so you don't get bogged down in divorce divorce purgatory and spend the next four years having to argue with this person. Now, some people are just very, very arguable, and that's what they want to do, but you're able to at least move the financial phase of the divorce along. Right. Right. And yeah. And sometimes that can be so helpful of just like, and I've seen a lot of clients do this where like, they can't, you know, they know that the kids, the aspect of the kids is going to take, you know, longer, there's more to do. There's different aspects coming up, but if we can move the financial side and kind of like get traction Mm -hmm. there at the very least, like one, you're going to learn something about, how they are acting in the legal process regardless. And two, it's like, well, if this, if I can remain fact-based and documentation based and not much harder to take the emotions out of it, but maybe like have a compartment for my emotions, I can see this side clearly too. But at the very least, getting one side of it done is half the battle anyway, because I see it go in reverse too. They'll get the kids sorted because that sometimes comes first or a lot of times it comes first. And then now they have to approach the finances and now it's like, okay, well, like if they, if the person lost control in another area, now they're going to get it here. So it's like the most you can do to kind of get prepared before and get clear and like spend the time and energy to really just like get it on paper. I also think the more confident you're going to feel going through this very complicated process. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many decisions you have to make. That if you don't know your financial facts, you're going to experience something called decision fatigue. And this is where your brain literally gets so tired. <laughs> it just mm-hmm. starts agreeing to things that might not be good for it because it wants it to be over. And so you need to build a team that's going to be supportive, that has your emotional back, but also is helping you plan for your financial future. Um, and I think it's really important for you guys to be kind to yourself. 
Um, it's okay if you don't know how much your life costs. Like we're Americans, like we mm-hmm. have no training in finance. I mean, they keep us stupid for a reason. So we just continue to spend. Generally, it's because you're not sure of how the divorce is going to impact all the other areas of your life that you don't agree to like a spousal support number or a child support number. Um, it, you have to really understand just what everything's going to cost and how this is going to work out. So you can feel empowered to, you know, if a, de- a good deal does come across the table, then you could actually take it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And also like, you know, so that you're, you don't get hung up on like the little nitty gritty things. I see people mm-hmm. go back and forth over like $22 or things like, like, li- it's like, <laughs> it's like at the end yeah. of the day, like my favorite, this is like probably a line some of my clients hate, but I'm like, you are paying your lawyer more to argue for that than, yes. the, you know, and there, I'm like, wait until that $22 is a thousand. And then maybe you take you, you know, but like for mm-hmm. a long, but when you're arguing over 2250, 150, like, like all these, it's like, these have to well, be financial decisions yeah. too in the long run. Well, and generally in those situations, it's not about the money. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, your unresolved financial feelings. Like, what does that money actually represent? Like, you know, did they, you know, siphon marital funds and have like a gambling addiction and right. or something like that? What what actually happened that made this your hill to die on? Exactly. Um, yeah, attorneys are not cheap, and you know, there's some good attorneys out there that'll be like, you should work with a coach or a financial expert because I'm not the best person to handle your, uh, your needs. But I think it's important that everyone knows attorneys are not trained um, in emotional regulation techniques to help you be a better um, seated when you deal with your co-parent or spouse, yeah. ex- soon to be spouse. And they also have no personal finance training. So what that means, it's mm-hmm. so crazy. But you guys, you know, if you lean on your attorney to provide financial support, what's going to end up happening is generally you, um, you know, their paralegal is the one that's helping you fill out the financial documentation. And they are not exactly trained to do that. They're yeah. there to help file court forms, but they're not financial advisors. They're not financial planners. They aren't divorce analysts. And so... I, as a CDFA, I am trained specifically in financial planning, how it pertains to a divorce and just what happens. And one of the things that blows my mind, and I feel like I can talk about this for hours, so please Mm -hmm. tell me to shut up, Jessica, but the number one thing that is going to change that no one's going to talk about is your income tax status overnight. When you go, when your divorce is actually finalized, you go from married status to either single or head of household. Single is when you have no dependents. Head of household is when you have um, a child or two. And it, it stinks because single, you, um, it, you'll end up paying anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand dollars more in taxes, depending on your income range. And so not only do you now have a new household that you're having to stretch uh, expenses over, not just one, now you have two houses. And Uncle Sam says, oh, by the way, you're going to pay more in taxes. So it's really important. And that's why I encourage everybody to get the budget blueprint. It'll help you actually line by line item, go through all of the very, very minute financial transitions that are are going to occur from like your health insurance all the way down to (laughs) your income taxes. Yeah. Um, Because you know, especially if you are like, Spousal support essentially comes down to uh, four different things, regardless of the state you're in. But it really is your marital standard of living. So what did it look like when you guys were married? What was the income? And if you guys are high income earning, like that's a little different, but you need to have documentation to show what the marital standard of living was. And then from that, very similar to how I have my budget blueprint set up, you project forward your post-divorce cost of living. So just what is it going to take to survive? You need real figures that are backed up with documentation. The other things that come into play are the payor's ability to pay. So the person who pays spousal support, how much can they actually afford? And the final thing is the pay is ability to earn. So the recipient, are they actually maximizing their education? And so it 
is mathematically driven. And that's where building a divorce financial report is really impactful because it takes it away the conversation from like, well, you know, you before having kids, you were making $120,000 um, in your field. Now you want to, you know, have flexible hours as an executive assistant and now you're making 50. Well, you have to figure out, this is a common argument I see in a lot of uh, my mediations where you have to figure out like what is actually pursuant to the divorce and what is pursuant based off of a lifestyle choice you made. And mm -hmm. this is where the courts really, um, they kind of get ham fisted, but if you're able to work with that other person, you're able to actually look at your balance, uh, at your budget blueprint and figure out, okay, with now we, we're paying more in income taxes. Now, like this is, I'm gonna need, we'll just call it $2,500 of support a month. Yeah. Um, and you based off of the other person, okay, well, if they give up their, you know, if they make half the amount of 401k contribution that they're doing right now and cut back on entertainment, they can meet that need. And so not only is it showing, showing where the need is, but then also helping the other person understand where the changes are going to be made. And maybe you're able to do this through mediation, but if you do end up having to go to litigation and go in front of a court, and have a judge make a decision for you. Mm -hmm. Everything is laid out. So it's, it's yes, it's stressful to go to court, but your argument is documentation backed. And really court, uh, you know, there's, it's a lot of things, but for the most part, it is a logical decision-making process in which you have to have an overwhelming preponderance of evidence in order to actually um, have a positive verdict in your desire. So yeah, yeah. I really appreciate how you go back to the basics of like, there's so much that once we start to figure it out, like we can put together a lot of the documentation. And that really is like the basis of, I mean, it's the basis of a lot of child custody stuff. But it's also the basis of the finances. Yeah. It's the yeah. same thing. Yeah. Just instead of with <laughs> it's numbers instead of, you know, the kids. So, right. and also like, I know finances are overwhelming, but Every single divorce professional is going to ask you, what is your budget? And if you don't know, please do not estimate. Please mm -hmm. do not. <laughs> like, you yeah, real information, because that's where on the income and expense declaration on the financial affidavit, there's literally like two inches where they give a very uh, abbreviated uh, budget estimation. And this is what I use to build out my report. And most of the time, especially if the other party is not taking the process seriously and they write down, like they spend a hundred dollars a month on clothes. Well, you know, based off of just <laughs> talking with their spouse, that could uh, nowhere near be truthful. That's the value that I'm going to use in my report to show just how much money they have in surplus or um, shortfall to pay support. So really like the numbers are the key to heaven, really. Mm -hmm. They are your the breadcrumbs that you're dropping along the way so you can find your way out of the forest. Yeah, yeah. I know that we left a lot of stuff on the table today um, to pick up on, but I really would love to have you back and to dive a little bit deeper into some of these things. Um, but for now, can you share how people can find you? Yeah, Again, my name is Victoria Kurloff. I am the founder of Divorce Analytics. You can follow me on Instagram at, at Divorce Analytics, or you can check out my website at divorceanalytics.com. I do offer free 30-minute consultations. Um, my whole goal is to help you turn your divorce into a period of rebirth. Mm -hmm. I know it's mm -hmm. painful, but this is the time to recalibrate your life and to use all of these awesome professionals to benefit your post-divorce life, especially if you have a co-parent that you're going to be communicating with for the rest of your life. So you can use Jessica to really build out that muscle and use me to really get your finances stabilized so your recovery can be absolutely astounding and you can reach the amount of success that you are truly put on this earth to achieve. Yeah. This is just a small hiccup in your life. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so, so much for joining me. This was so insightful for me and I know it was going to be so insightful for so many people. And I'm really looking forward to doing this again with you. Yeah, it was fantastic. Thanks for having me, Jessica. Of course. Of course.